Veronica Monet, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Hey, I'm really honored to be here, Howie. Thank you for having me. So we are going to have a, a, I think, a wide ranging conversation. And one of, one of the things I'm interested in is you're a coach. You introduced me, I would think it was three or four months ago, to a, a healing modality called IFS, Internal Family Systems. Yes. Um, and you, you were excited about it enough. And I'd heard about it many times. And I never, you know, sort of like, OK, yeah, I should check that out. I should read that. I should find out about it. And I never did until something in your description made me go look it up, get the books. And it's led me, as I, we were talking about before we started recording, it's led me into other realms that have absolutely transformed my coaching and my life. So to, for that, I owe you a, a huge thank you. Mm. Thank you. Okay. I'm glad. You know, how I just want to say the reason that I'm so excited about internal family systems or IFS is because it is, well, number one, aside from MD, EMDR, it is the only documented form of therapy that actually heals trauma. So things like cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, which is you know very common, they don't they don't really touch it. I mean, yeah, you get the catharsis of rehashing your story, but you don't actually heal. So I, I love things that work. Mm -hmm. um, and the other reason I'm really excited about it is because it does not um, demonize. So you can work with people who have done terrible things in a way that's loving and still is leading them to the place of accountability. And as you know, I'm, I'm working on my second book right now, which is a memoir about um, extensive childhood abuse. And, you know, these are people that I love, my father, mother, you know, grandparents, aunts, uncles, being able to see their perpetrations through IFS helps me understand my childhood of being very much feeling a loving connection with these people and horrified by their behavior. Mm -hmm. And when I see that people have parts and that these parts, when, when the person who has parts is traumatized, their parts do not uh, function as a whole. They're fractured and they, they have these various different parts that are doing different things. And that was so much my experience with my dad. He, um, he had this side that was childlike and sweet and loving and innocent and vulnerable and prone to tears. And then he had this other side that was mean and cold and icy and cruel. And I, I got the distinct feeling these two parts of him didn't know each other. Mm. So if I confronted the sweet daddy about what the bad daddy was doing. He was like, I don't know what you're talking about. That never happened. And it was so confusing to see that people have this, this amnesia about their bad behavior. But of course, as a relationship coach, I've encountered a lot of that. People have all kinds of complicated denial systems. And one of the things I love about IFS is it helps us integrate. And it does that way in a, a loving way. And I don't like um, discarding and canceling people. I want us to heal. Yeah, yeah. Well, and what um, my daughter has been trying was trying to get me to watch the TV show Euphoria for a long time, and it's it a very so sort of know. hip young person HBO show. Lots of like sex and drugs and all sorts of things. So. Uh, you know, fun, fun yeah. for father daughter viewing. But there was there was one one episode <laughs> in which the the main character uh, Rue is talking in a diner. The whole the whole episode is her and and her sponsor, her um, twelve step sponsor in a diner. And you know she's lying half the time, and he can see through her bullshit. But and you know he's kind of older and wiser. And um, there's a yeah. a bit in which he says something like. Um, I don't want to live in a world where there's no opportunity for redemption because in that because people don't don't think they can be redeemed. So why bother? And well, yes. And then they also split off. So if you if you if you have so much guilt and shame that you can't face who you are, you are going to excuse it, minimize it and forget it. 
And we see this, we see this in a lot of religious organizations where there are um, bad players within the ranks, but nobody wants to face it because father so-and-so is such a sweet guy. And, you know, one of the things I love about IFS is, well, of course he is. And he's also a pedophile. I mean, this is the thing. How do we bring people to accountability if we only see the side that we want to relate to? And people do that with themselves. They don't have the courage to see the parts of themselves that are acting out in ways that are mm-hmm. harmful. So, so let's, uh, let's, let's not get ahead of so. ourselves into, into IFS. I want to kind of... You know. <laughs> I have a habit of doing that, Howie, so feel free to rein me in. And let's, let's go down the rabbit hole right, if you so want I'll, I'll rein in your cheerleader until, until it's the you know, halftime show. Um, Got it. But, you know, I kind of want to like slow down and kind of explain what it is. But but first, I, I'd love to explore like your journey, because you um, in many ways have had experiences that most people um, haven't had. And and, fi- you know, th- there's a way in which sort of the extremeness of a lot of what you've gone through yeah. can can both sort of like you know, titillate and separate you like you're different, but also like you're you're more the same, <laughs> you know, like there's <laughs> you it's just sort of a concentrated um, form of human experience. But it's yeah. very it's very relatable and connectable, I think. Oh, I'm so glad you see it that way. Um, I was right. Ra- I was actually born into a a conservative Christian cult called the Worldwide Church of God. And it's considered a doomsday cult that was founded by somebody named Herbert W. Armstrong. He was basically just a journalist who wanted to um, print glossy magazines and go buy himself a couple jets. And um, he made a a lot of money uh, off of the mandatory tithes. Mm. Um, my mother was a very devout member of that church, and it was really strict. Uh, it controlled the way that women were allowed to show up in the world. So women were never allowed to be uh, pastors or, or deacons or anything like that. They weren't even allowed to get up on the podium and speak unless it was just to, they couldn't do announcements, something as simple as announcements. They could do special music. That was it. Uh, and then the dress was controlled, like what, you know, what kind of clothes or makeup we were or were not allowed. And it changed all the time, depending on the founder's whims, like whatever he thought. Mm. And this guy's like, you know, in his 80s at the time. And was it so it was really restricted. Was it like living in a compound or everyone lived in sort of in, in, in town? And no, no, everybody, every, it was nuclear family. So everybody just had their, their isolated little families. And then we'd meet for Saturdays to go to church. Um, and the, the church was, it, it thought that the end of the world was coming. First, it was predicted in 1975. And when, when that didn't happen, then uh, they found some excuse so that we could all go believing that the world was going to end soon. We were the chosen elect. And we were going to be saved from the end of the world. So we had to stockpile uh, food and uh, always be prepared to leave in a minute's notice, which meant that um, we met in, our church services were like in other people's churches and um, gymnasiums and high schools and things like that. And the locations were kind of secret. So um, you had to know somebody to even become a member. And we were taught that we were Israelites. And, and uh, I was taught that I was from the lost tribe of Manasseh. Manasseh. And so we, we, we did Old Testament, uh, no pork, no shellfish, uh, Sabbath day from Friday sunset to Saturday sunset, all kinds of holy days, no holidays. They were all pagan, no birthdays, also pagan. Very, very, very strict mm. and isolated. And interestingly mm. enough, pedophilia was not like openly um, espoused by this cult, but the cult founder was having an incestuous relationship with his daughter that he was hiding from everybody. And it was interesting because you know my father uh, molested my sister and I, and um, a lot of the church members were molesting their kids, but it was very secretive and, and hidden. So it wasn't like children of God where they were doing it out in the open. Um, 
But yeah, I had, to, I had to read the Bible from cover to cover when I was 12 and memorize verses on flashcards. And I was incredibly devout um, until I was 19 and mm. I left the cult. Wow, there's, there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> So, so there's one intense thing. There's one intense thing. My my father, meanwhile, was mentally ill and uh, was afraid of germs. He had obsessive compulsive disorder, and that shaped our life uh -huh. too in ways that were very rigid yeah. and controlled. So, I mean, what I'll reflect back to. And I didn't go to I didn't go to school. Okay. I was homeschooled. I was homeschooled my entire life until I went to Oregon State University, um, and I. I was a tutor there and I got great grades. I graduated with honors. Right. There's the first 22 yeah. years. So what, I mean, what I'll reflect back to you is, <laughs> yeah, it was extremely different from certainly the way I grew up and most, you know, everyone that I know. And when you're talking about yeah. themes of women being held down and, you know, sexual abuse of children, and controlling like that sounds pretty mainstream to me honestly uh, oh oh and with with what a lot of red states are trying to do right now uh i i i routinely get triggered every time i hear about some new law that's being passed in a red state that's controlling women's bodies women's lives and even their freedom of movement um schools control clothing of young girls all of that mm. is very triggering for me and so you're absolutely right it's incredibly relatable mm. so when, when you say you were you were devout yeah. um it, you i mean I'm, I'm imagining as a child you to you know you of course you buy in to what you're being told what what, what were the things that first felt wrong like this isn't necessarily the way to live or this isn't necessarily the best. It's when I read the Bible from cover to cover when I was 12. Um, I thought I was convinced I was taught to believe that when I read the Bible, I was going to have a spiritual awakening. I was just going to feel so close to God and euphoric. And I was waiting and waiting and waiting for that. And I thought, well, all I have to do is get through all the begats. Um, <laughs> but by the time I read the very last sentence in Revelations, I had a, an experience I wasn't expecting. I felt nauseous like I was going to mm. vomit. And I remember thinking, there's something wrong with me. I don't know why this book makes me feel like throwing up. I must, my mom's right. I, I must be allowing Satan to talk to me because every time I'd have questions about time, universe, space, um, you know, what's, where, where, what's out there in outer space? How do we know we exist? All these kind of deep philosophical questions. And I'm having them at a very young age because I guess I'm a little bit precocious. Um, my mother would accuse me of being uh, that Satan was hmm. talking to me. So when I finished um, the Bible, I did not have this spiritual awakening I was wanting and craving and instead had this really nauseous, horrible feeling. Then I thought there was something hmm. wrong with me. It would be by the time I'm around 15, now I'm starting to see some of the hypocrisy in the church. I'm noticing that people are doing things that the church preaches against uh, and they're hiding it and they're lying about it. And I'm seeing the hypocrisy and it's really starting to bother me. But it's not until I'm 19 and already in college that I give myself permission to officially separate from the cult. I was at a church convention up in um, Washington, the state of Washington, and there were probably 10,000 people there. And the founder, Herbert W. Armstrong, was pounding the podium and said, how dare you question me? I am the right hand of God. And when he said that, I went, that's heresy. I get to mm. leave finally. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was the church's own teachings uh, about heresy that I, I went, oh, he just committed a sin. Uh, mm. And I get to leave. And I, I didn't know he was a pedophile and I didn't know he was, you know, had raped his daughter. There was all kinds of things I didn't know about him, but I knew he had mm. committed heresy. 
Um, so, but the training is so deep. Then even after I left and I started having all kinds of premarital sex and drinking and smoking and doing drugs, I would never speak ill of the founder because um, I was so afraid God was going to strike me dead with a bolt of lightning. Mm. When you went to when you went to college, Crazy. did you keep all this to yourself? Because you said it was a secretive organization. Did did you have people you could talk to who could kind of reflect different worldviews? This was all going on inside. It's all going on inside. And, and there's parts of me that are pulling away. So I'm feeling kind of ashamed to even be associated with this cult. Um, yeah. And, you know, I was trying so hard being a homeschooled child with no peers, having been severely isolated and kept separate from the world and all of its holidays and habits and jokes and music and movies. And I, I know nothing about the world. You know, it can just kind of paint me Amish in some ways. Um, not entirely, but to some extent. I mean, I'm really grateful that I had all of the family and Mary Tyler Moore, that I got to watch those shows and get some idea about uh -huh. the dominant culture. But here I am in college trying to assimilate. And it's as if I came in from a foreign country. So I was going out of my way to hide my roots um, and where I came from and just be a quote unquote normal mm. kid. So when when you left, were you able yeah. to sort of come out to people? Did you have a friend group whom you felt safe enough to say, hey, this is my background? I'd have to say no. Uh, and it there's a lot of denial around it. it. The shame of being a member of a weird cult and the shame of actually leaving it and feeling like you've betrayed your family and disappointed your mother. Um, it's just becomes something that, you know, at that particular time in my life, I'm, I'm not in therapy. I'm doing drugs and alcohol. Um, I just do more drugs mm. and alcohol. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's so how it's, you it's... And I did, I became a full blown alcoholic. Yeah. I became an alcoholic. That's, that's what I, uh -huh. that's how I cope. Okay. Um, were you in, t yeah. were you in touch? Yeah. Now, fortunately for me, I still, I, were you in touch with your huh? family during this time or had you, had you cut off I'm ties? Sorry. Well, my father had disowned me when I was 19 and it wasn't because I left the cult. Um, he, he disowned me because he saw me as being very rebellious and he didn't like the way I was living my life. Also, you know, really the reason he disowned me is because I called him out on the pedophilia. Um, but at the time when I'm 19, I just, I really didn't, wasn't piecing that together and understanding that I was just, you know, he's ashamed mm. of me and he doesn't want to claim me as his child anymore. So um, my mother and I kept in touch and, and I will always Feel, you know, my mother's in uh, memory care now, and she doesn't even remember who I am. But um, I'm very devoted to my mother and taking care of her because no matter what I did, and my life has had a lot of different stages to it, my mother has just always loved me. She might have been angry with me. She might have at times been verbally and emotionally abusive. She was not a good mother. She, she never protected me from my father's sexual perpetrations. But um, she loved me, and that was constant throughout. And it, so I, I feel a lot of uh, loyalty to her. Mm. Do, do you have siblings? I have a younger sister. She's younger by two years. Okay. And she stayed in the cult well into her 30s. Mm. <laughs> She and my dad, I didn't know this. After my dad died, I, I closed out his estate and um, took possession of some of his papers. And I found these old letters uh, between him and my sister where they were basically uh, saying that I was demon possessed. Mm. <laughs> so, and she and I, we, you know, we, we kind of had a friendship, but it was, it was up and down and back and forth and stop and go kind of thing. Mm. And um, I don't know. It's a hard question to ask, but you know, did she experience your father's 
uh, abuse in the same way? Do you know? Yeah. Worse, worse. She was a daddy's girl. Growing up, I felt very jealous because he favored her over me. And um, I felt cheated um, of his love. And he was always comparing me to her. Mm. Um, she was always better than me, prettier in his eyes. Um, and more of a proper wife material. Mm. <laughs> I had a bad attitude and no man would ever want me. Mm. That's what my dad was always telling me. And of course, I was raised in a household that believed that a woman's purpose was for a man to want her um, and to be a good wife. And when I got ready to go to college, my dad did make a last ditch effort to help me not ruin my life that way. Uh, he took me aside and he says, you don't need to go to college. Just stay here and get yourself a real job. And in a couple of years, you're going to be married and start having babies of your own. <laughs> So he, he had it all planned out for me. Um, my sister, on the other hand, um, eventually she and my dad had a falling out, but it took years. She stayed very attached to him. And, um, you know, I, it's a very painful thing to say, but it's true that when she was 13, my dad raped her. And my father... My father never did that to me. He fondled. Um, he threatened. He said, if you ever lose your virginity, it would be very difficult for me not to have sex with you too. So I grew up with this threat hanging over my head, but it never actually mm. happened. And it did happen to her. And I was at a church convention with my mother when it happened. And when I came back, I took one look at her dead eyes and I knew what had happened. And she was never the same. So one of the things that I love about IFS is that we get to love people even when they do terrible things. One of the things that I appreciate about being a survivor is I do not in any way, shape, or form minimize the damage that perpetrating against a child creates. It can be a lifelong mm -hmm. handicap. And I'm really grateful that I wasn't a daddy's girl. I'm really grateful that he hated me mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. But it took uh, a long time to get there. Did, did you? Um, yeah. Did you want to protect your sister? Oh, yes and no. Um, there were so. My father set the household up so that all the women were competing against each other. Mm. Um, and there was a lot of division. And so instead of being you know, supportive of each other and helpful to each other, we were constantly undermining each other. I felt like as this family scapegoat that my role was to support everybody in the family, but they didn't support me. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was how I survived. I, I survived by making myself valuable as a, an empath and somebody who was kind of a family therapist, believe it or not, <laughs> at a young age. <laughs> Everybody came to tell me their problems. So um, that's where my coaching practice started when I was a kid. Yeah. A... But um, my, my sister was, was cruel towards me at times. And I, I think I was, I kind of gave up on her in a lot of ways. When we got older, um, I told her that I felt partly responsible for her being raped. And um, she dismissed that. She said, you were a kid. What could you have done about that? Hmm. So I did, I did feel some guilt and shame about that for a long, long time. And I eventually found the thing that I needed to make amends for, <clears throat> which was not that I somehow or another caused it or it could have even prevented it, but that I was so angry with her for the way she had hurt me and betrayed me that... Um, I didn't care what happened to her mm. when that happened. Right after it happened, I sure cared. Um, I was devastated. And I, I bore that shame for decades. And we, she and I ended up having a, a tearful, I, I was in my 40s. She and I were both in our 40s. And um, 
this was like the 20th time I'd made amends to her, but now I had finally found the real thing, which was, I was angry with you. And, um, we hugged and she wiped the tears from my face and she goes, so I hope this is the last time we need to talk about this. Mm. <laughs> Cause she, for her, she had forgiven me a long time ago, mm. but it took me a long time to forgive me. Mm. Yeah. So let's, yeah. uh, let's jump back to, to the point in your narrative before I ask all those questions. You're, you're now in your early twenties and you are coping with yeah. life through out al through alcohol abuse. And what else is going on? Yes. And, and then eventually I get my degree in uh, psychology and graduate with honors and immediately dive deep into my drug and alcohol addiction. Uh, managed to hold down several corporate jobs until I don't get a DUI, um, end up uh, injecting drugs twice. Was cocaine was my drug of choice and realizing that I was the kind of addict who was going to burn out and die very quickly. So, um, I had reached a rock bottom. I mean, just this place where I didn't want to be alive anymore. I actually said a prayer. Just let me die, please. I'm, I'm done. And had two dreams, one about how I was hurting myself, one about how I was hurting the people I love. Interestingly enough, it was a dream about my sister. Hmm. And uh, woke up, fell to my knees, and prayed to get sober that day. That was September 4th, 1985, and I haven't had a drink since. Whew. By the grace of my higher power. Hmm. And it was, that was the spiritual awakening that I had hoped to receive when I read the Bible. Hmm. That was the spiritual awakening I'd been craving my whole life. Uh, so what what did you do to get sober and stay sober other than that prayer? Uh, immediately went off to a bunch of 12 step meetings, which because we're at the level of press, radio and film, I'll just have to keep it vague and say 12 step. But I'm sure, everybody knows what I'm talking about. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> And I, the first 30 days were such a blur. I was in meetings and coffee shops, chain smoking and hanging on for dear life um, in this horrible phase, you know, like haze. I, I, I don't remember anything except just meeting after meeting after meeting. And um, I got up from my 30 day chip and I was so excited that I'd gone 30 days without a drink that I thought I should celebrate by having um, a drink. <laughs> uh -huh. I, and I did not. Uh -huh. I, I did not. But I remember thinking, I, remember thinking, I don't even know how to celebrate without alcohol. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, today, I, I sponsor women. And, um, and I, I, every day when I wake up, I say a prayer of gratitude to be sober. Mm. And I'm imagining that you know, through your IFS work, you also can look at the alcohol as having saved your life at some, at, in a certain way, <laughs> like that phase. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I would have committed suicide. The pain of growing up in this incredibly oppressive environment because, you know, it wasn't just the cult and it wasn't just the child molestation and it wasn't just the domestic violence and it wasn't just the fact that my father was mentally ill, although that's a big part of it there. Living with a mentally ill parent is it's a pain of its own flavor. Um, but being isolated from the world and constantly having this threat of rape and, and being killed. Because my, fa my father had this game he liked to play grab me by the neck and squeeze real tight and say, you know, I could kill you right now. He thought mm. it was funny. So I had to laugh. Ha ha ha. That's so funny, dad. But there was just this way. Um, he, he loved guns and um, he had a really bad temper. And sometimes he killed animals in front of me. So you just grow up feeling afraid all the time. And 
when I would go to him and ask him to stop fondling my breast, he told me it wasn't happening. So then I started splitting off and thinking I must be going crazy. Mm. That was hard. And, and then you start attacking yourself and thinking that there's something wrong with you and you're getting scapegoated all the time and you think there's something wrong with you and pretty soon you don't want to be alive anymore. So when I first snuck into my dad's pain pills and alcohol stash, it was the first time that I found a reason mm. to be alive. So you're absolutely right. Alcohol and drugs saved my life mm. until they almost took it. So what, what, what changed when you got sober? Everything changed. Everything changed. Um, I found a new family in the 12 step recovery meetings. Um, just loved these people still do. And, um, I found I was young and I was 25. So there were all kinds of things that I wasn't experiencing. I, you're not living when you're holed up in an apartment doing lines with the drapes drawn, being all paranoid, you know, and you, you eventually run out of cocaine and guess what? You know, the next thing you know, it's crystal meth. We called it crank back then, but it's the same thing. And, you know, it just gets more and more paranoid and more and more dark and more and more isolated. So here, all of a sudden, there were picnics and barbecues and dances and socials and, and parties and people were laughing and they weren't drinking. And this was just a brand new world that opened up to me. And then things just start to become pretty darn magical very quickly. Um, I started going to a... Um, Science of Mind Church, because I, I still have some parts of me that are looking for some kind of religious message, and I'm experimenting and exploring, and I'm going to the Science of Mind Church because I like the fact that it's more metaphysical, and I meet a man there who's got a little community access cable TV show, and he's like, I want to give you a show. I've never done television. Um so now, all of a sudden, I'm sitting in front of a TV camera in a television studio interviewing people on a lot of different topics, everything from um, latchkey children to earthquake preparedness. And, um, and I really took to it. I loved it. And I got good at it. And then I started training our new um, hosts so that they knew how to interview and um, then I started working behind the scenes and operating cameras and, and you know, the putting in the uh, lower thirds for people's names. And I just, I worked all aspects of it. Um, it was exciting. And around this same time, I did um, my first theater, uh, acted in a, a theater production. It was um, in a little tiny theater, all this stuff is really small and none of it's paying, but it was a lot of fun. My creativity is starting to really um, take off. And I had a little column and an alternative paper called What's Love Got to Do With It? So I start writing, which was a dream of mine since I was eight years old to be an author. What did you, what did you write about? And um, yeah. What's love got to do about it? It was a relationship advice <laughs> column. <laughs> so, so that's back in like 1986 or seven. And here I am now a relationship coach and have been for the last 18 years. Do you ha did, have you saved those columns? Yeah. Do you look, ever read them? Oh, yeah. What did you, I still have I what, picked paper really old what did and you, yellow What did you know point. or think you knew at that point about relationships? I have no clue. I'd have to go back and read. I mean, seriously, one of the things that was strange about my life, Howie, is here I am, this really messed up kid, and I've got people coming to me for advice when I'm 17 before I even leave home. When I get to college at the age of 18, they voted my room Grand Central Station because so many girls were in and out of that room seeking relationship and sex advice. And I'm like, why? I don't know. I, I think I just have um, an energy about me that makes mm. me easy to talk to. 
So um, I would not have gone to me for advice. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> but people were, and um, I, I had, remember my survival mechanism was being kind of the therapist for my mom, uh -huh, dad, and yeah. sister. So that was, that was something that just came natural to me. Great. So, so now you have this creative outlet. Um, you're, you're seeing that life can be fun yeah. without um, mind altering substances. You're yeah. making friends. Um, then what? Well, then uh, corporate America happened to me because this whole time um, I am working as a temporary secretary because I, you know, at a, at a college, I became a manager. I was a, first an office manager, then a department manager. And um, then I um, lost my job because of my drugs and alcohol mm. problem and bad attitude that went with it. I was I was an angry drunk. So um, I become a temporary secretary and I'm working for Xerox Corporation and they're really progressive in the way that they are treating their temporaries. They send us to a training. They give us access to the company gym. We might as well be employees. We just don't have benefits. Mm -hmm. And um, the training is to leadership through quality where we manage the managers. And this is just I love it. I took to it like crazy. Then one of those managers um, got a job at Digital Equipment Corporation, and he uh, wanted me to be his private secretary. And I loved him. He was a great guy. Uh, his wife was a secretary. He really was respectful towards secretaries. So we go into this new company having no clue that they've got a completely different um, um, culture. And they don't like the fact that I manage managers. And they start putting him and I kind of on a hit list. They end up taking me away from him and transporting him to another department where he, he's not even allowed to have a secretary. And they put me um, with another pool, another secretarial pool. And I proceed to be um, written up for things like not smiling enough and uh, that was, I, I didn't have a, a public facing job. I'm stuck in a cubicle, just, you know, phones and paperwork. So but then I go to H&R and I, I start complaining about sexism in the job. And um, it was a long battle. And I almost had a nervous breakdown because I just started getting uh, scapegoated like crazy. They ended up sending me to the company shrink. Sorry. I talk like that sometimes because I have the psychology degree, but whatever. The company psychologist who said, you don't actually have a problem. This department's oh. dysfunctional. <laughs> God bless her, man. Because I was hanging by a thread at this point. And I was, I was susceptible to people telling me that I'm the problem uh -huh. because of my father who told me that I was crazy. So um, anyway... I ended up, I went to see an attorney I was going to sue, but it was at that point, 1989. And he, he said, Reagan's in office. And unless your employer crawls through your bedroom window and rapes you, I'm sorry, mm. I can't take it to court. It was a different time. And uh, so I went to work for a radio station as a marketing representative. And at that point, uh, the manager would send me out to, um, certain jobs with this admonishment. Why don't you take this account? This guy likes a good looking pair of legs. Uh -huh. Now I'm going to get 10% commission for basically letting my boss pimp me out. And I'm trying to play along and be a good sport. And I go out to this car dealership and I try to get him to sign for advertising, work with him for probably, I don't know, two or three months. And then he says to me, you know, I'm not going to sign with you. The truth of the matter is the only reason I have let you come back all these times is because I really want you to go out with me. And that's when I decided um, hmm. I quit. <laughs> so I had it, but it's, it's not quite that straight of a, a, a line because in the backdrop of this, I am 
having my own coming out experience. And I'm starting to realize that I'm bisexual. And it's very upsetting to me because I think now that I've gotten clean and sober, I'll finally be good. And my mother will finally be proud mm -hmm. of me. And I know she's a homophobe, so that's not going to work. And I'm, I'm like in tears and upset. And I'm finally trying to accept the fact that I'm bisexual and that's just the way I'm wired. And I've been that way my whole life. And I could trace it back to was I like nine years old. I remember having a crush on a neighbor girl. Um, so while I'm grappling with that, I started dating a woman, very beautiful married woman with three kids who just happened to be a high end hmm. escort. And her life at first, I felt really sad for her that she didn't have a college education like me and wasn't a feminist like me. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I can help her um, see the light and get out of this terrible, degrading job. And somewhere along the line, I realized I was in a terrible, degrading job. Mm. And I asked her if I could come work with her. And that's how in sobriety four years clean and sober after seven years of corporate america and a college degree i became an escort uh, was th was there a moment where you're sort of the morality kind of flipped and you're like not just that you know the, but like there's something empowering about you know i don't know agency getting paid for it when when you saw like women when women have been being used for sex without agency or particularly consent that that kind of like you know taking the initiative taking the bull by the horns sort of like what 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 was the flip that's like i'm, I'm gonna do this there's, well, there's layers there, there's layers to this so one is that I, being an honor student they gave me every credit card known to man and i unfortunately maxed them all out and now i couldn't pay them back on these stupid little secretarial oh. wages so i thought well i'm gonna make some money to pay back these credit cards and then I'll get out. So I, it wasn't at first like a career change that I planned to stay with. That was going on. Then there was the fact that my initial introduction to it was basically having sex with my girlfriend who I would have had sex with for free and was having sex with for free, but letting somebody watch us. And I'm like, well, what's hmm. the harm in that? Um, and I'm getting paid to make love to my girlfriend. So, you know, gradually I start thinking, well, would I be willing to do something else? So kind of easing into it, I suppose. Um, finding out that she was a happy person who didn't do drugs and alcohol was a shock to my system. I had a stereotype about sex workers that they were all addicts. I'm clean and sober. I don't think that these are compatible life choices, but she's not drinking. I never saw her finish a glass of wine in my the whole time I knew her. So I was confused about that. And it challenged some of my stereotypes and assumptions. Plus, she's like super healthy. She works out six days a week. She seems happy. She's married. She's got three kids. She lives in a house, drives a nice car. I'm like, this is not the stereotype that I see mm. on the five o'clock news. Um, the other thing that was going on was anger about being passed over for well-deserved promotions and raises um, by corporate jobs. Seven years of that, I was, I'm fed up with it. And then the last straw was a job where they were literally trying to pimp me out. Um, I was sick of it. So yeah, all that stuff's going on. Now, what about the morality aspects of it? I'm not having the same... Um, opinion about sex that a lot of people are have before any of this. Um, I'm feeling that this goes back to my mother. My mom did two things that I really appreciate. When I was probably four or five years old, she took me out into the backyard, showed me all the gorgeous flowers and plants and said, this is how you get to know God. Hmm. The other thing she did was when I was nine years old and I found out that there was such a thing as sex and I found out there were orgasms, I said, mommy, what are orgasms like? And my mother's face lit up and she smiled. And she says, oh, honey, it's God's way of letting you know what's waiting for you in heaven. Mm. So I already had an attitude that sex was meant to be a beautiful thing, not the kind of sex that my father was trying to perpetrate. 
but that there was some kind of sex out there that could be healing and could be ascendant and could actually connect us to the divine instead of separating us. And when I reject the cult, I also reject the Bible and its teachings. I become very curious about other thoughts like goddess cultures where there's so much focus on how women have been demonized, women's bodies and women's sexuality have been demonized over the millennia. And I really start to reclaim my sense of my birthright as, as a female. So it starts to be that I have a feminism, which is incredibly sex positive, but it's, you know, it's a gradual thing. If it hadn't been for being in debt and being fed up with corporate jobs, I probably would not have made that choice. Mm. Although getting to know a sex worker really changed my idea about what sex work was. So I became more and more curious. I wanted to be able to call my own shots and be in charge of my life. And I've been in therapy for four years at that point as an incest survivor, really intense therapy, kind of therapy that, um, you know, has you doing a lot of grieving. Um, I was in groups, support groups. Um, there was one group that I was a member of where we actually confronted the parents who had sexually perpetrated against their children. It was a great program. And I was making huge strides and experiencing a lot of healing. But one of the things that I was still craving was feeling this confidence. And I, it was kind of like becoming an escort became lab work for me. Mm -hmm. It was like, I've been studying this and studying this and really making a lot of strides. And now I want to put it into practice. And I realized that most people would think that what I just said was absolutely back, you know, backwards. It's like, no, when you get well, when you heal from sexual trauma, you're supposed to become monogamous and um, faithful and married and all this stuff. And because promiscuity and sex work is a sign of trauma and it's a sign of some kind of uh, cry for help, as it were. Mm. I'm really well versed in the in the dominant narrative around that, and it's not my experience. Mm. Well, it's, it sounds like for you, I found it to be very healing. Yeah, it sounds like for you, the the healing was agency, as opposed to victimhood. Yeah, yeah, it was, and it was also so. I was pretty angry at men when I started off as a sex worker and I was, you know, sure, I'll take their money. Why not? Um, <laughs> a little bit. J I'm very jaded and angry for two reasons. I'm jaded and angry because of the sexism and sexual harassment that I've encountered on the job in corporate um, jobs. And I'm also very jaded because at this point I had already been raped once by a co-ed in college, once by a co-worker at one of my jobs. And, um, you know, men are kind of on my, um, my list of the enemy at this point, but I really love my girlfriend and I'm, I'm really moving towards kind of a, almost a lesbian view of life, my lesbian view of life. I don't want to say all lesbians feel this way, but lesbian separatism is a thing. And I was really starting to identify with that, but the men that I saw the men who were my clients changed my perspective on that because they were in those moments that they were with me, especially on the other side of an orgasm. I saw them as incredibly childlike and vulnerable. So maybe this is where IFS comes into. I got to see other parts of them that weren't sexist and weren't domineering and weren't patriarchal. And I started to think that men maybe were more complex than the demonized version mm. that I had assumed. And I started to feel compassion for men. And about um, a year and a half, two years into being an escort, I married a man. Mm. And so I worked in escorting for about 17 years. 
And for um, 15 of those years, I was a married woman. Mm. So I'm uh, very much mm. in love with my husband. I'm imagining, though, that the, the men you're meeting through escort work, there's a kind of a selection bias, right? Like, so, very and, and much like, so. like I wouldn't, th I wouldn't yeah. immediately assume that these are the men that you would see as sort of, you know, paragons of of having this other side of, of you know, sensitivity and and need. Like, it seemed, you know, just my. I would imagine that 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 the the men who go pay pay an escort are going to be typically more sexist or or want to do things that are no you would it would be it would be absolutely unequivocally wrong about hmm. that um every kind of man pays for sex not every man pays for sex but every kind of man pays for sex. So let's just be very clear about that. You know, sex workers are finally, I've been a sex worker rights activist for 30 years and um, watched some laws, <clears throat> excuse me, here in California change so that sex workers have protections against uh, rape and assault. That wasn't the case just five years ago mm. even. The World Health Organization is for decriminalizing uh, and Amnesty International is for decriminalizing. A lot of countries around the world have started to decriminalize. The Democratic Socialist Party is in favor of decriminalizing. So we have finally gotten to this place where we don't want to do harm against sex workers. But the one thing that we're still really entrenched in and invested in is demonizing men who pay for sex. And I'm not going to participate in that. Um, are there sexist men? Are there serial rapists who see prostitutes? Oh, yeah. And I've met them. Are they the bulk? Are they the majority? Not even slightly. There are... Doctors, lawyers, uh, CEOs, um, engineers, plumbers, truckers, um, you can name any socioeconomic category, any educational level, and any occupation, any race, any country of origin, and also any religious faith, and you're going to find a certain percentage of those men pay for sex. The reasons that men pay for sex are incredibly diverse. Sometimes it's to lose their virginity. Sometimes it's because they love their wife and she is in bed, incapable of having sex, but they still want, they still want to have a sex life. Sometimes their wife is giving them permission in order to them for them to continue to have a vibrant sex life, even though she doesn't want to have sex or isn't capable of having sex. Sometimes men do it because they travel a lot and they feel entitled. Do I like that entitlement? No. Does that make them different than other men? Not even a tiny bit. There's lots of entitlement that is taken for granted. And there's a lot of single guys fresh out of college working jobs, being bachelors, who see escorts. And they're not sexist, they're lonely. So what, yeah, what I'm, what I'm hearing is. Oh, and let's talk, let's talk about it. I, Howie, I also, I, I just, while we're on it, cause I was just on a panel a month ago, I really wanna bring out that there's also men who are differently abled or handicapped, whichever word you're more comfortable with, who do not have any hope for one reason or another, societal biases, access, fear, shame, embarrassment, ineptitude, you know, many different reasons for it, um, capacities, who also seek the services of sex workers, men who are in wheelchairs, men who are flat on their back, um, incapable of doing anything, but still want to express their sexuality. Sexuality is an important core element of being alive. So um, we can't paint with a broad brush. 
And I realized that we've got a narrative that says that paid sex is in itself an act of rape. I'm a rape survivor and I'm a former sex worker. Then that's just a bald faced lie. They don't have anything in common with each other. So, you know, the way I grew up is the, the, you know, the idea that, well, if you're paying for sex, then there can't be emotional truth in it. But as I hear you talk, it sounds kind of like the difference between having friends you can talk to and having therapists you can talk to. Like you're paying the therapist, but that doesn't mean that there's no emotional connection. Oh, yes. Thank you. This is something I I've used that example so many times I've said. And I also use the food example like, OK, let me ask you something. If your grandmother fixes you a home cooked meal, that feels one way, right? Or mommy fixes you a, a batch of cookies that has a, a certain emotional component to it because she's feeding you. But what if you go through the drive through or you go to your favorite French restaurant? They're all different. And yet somehow or another, we don't demonize the various different ways that we seek out food. Um, sex is the one area that we're not actually allowed to pay for it without feeling some kind of shame burden. And if there's one thing that I can thank my parents for in isolating me from my peer group and homeschooling me and forcing me into this stupid cult was that I can think out of the box. I don't feel shackled to what I consider to be some really limiting hmm. views. Um, I give myself permission to entertain other ideas. I think sex can be a really healing thing. And there's a, a group of women in um, Australia they are prostitutes. They like to call themselves prostitutes. And um, they educate themselves to multiple sclerosis and quadriplegia and all different kinds of disabilities, just like nurses, so that they can go into hospitals and into care facilities and help bring sexual um, connection to these men in a way that's mm. very loving and healing. So what do you what do you think is at the root of society's yeah. unease or opprobrium of paid sex work? Is is it that women are getting paid? <laughs> <laughs> well, there was some of that initially. I mean, let's face it, um, the Wild West was settled by miners prostitutes and gold, you know, gold miners and prostitutes. That's, that's, that's why we even had towns in Alaska and hmm. California. Um, and then when the good women from the East coast arrived, they wanted sidewalks, uh, so that they wouldn't sink down into the mud and they wanted to move the brothels to the outskirts of town until the good women arrived. Uh, men were marrying prostitutes. There's all you got to do is crack a history book. It is exactly what founded um, this part of the West Coast of the United States. So and, and the other thing to know is that um, when uh, Florence Nightingale was starting to recruit nurses, it was taboo for women to see or touch naked men's bodies. So the first nurses were also prostitutes. Hmm. Uh, because they were the ones who would do it. And in the Civil War, a lot of times the hospitals were brothels. There were brothels that were converted to hospitals. So we, we've got a, like a really suppressed history mm. that we don't know the contribution that uh, sex workers have made to our culture and to the founding of this country even. And I, I always want to elevate that. Mm. We have... Um, a monogamous view, you know, one of the remaining big taboos is polyamory. So gay rights really advanced with the monogamy message. Mm -hmm. We want to get married. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you start talking about marriage and family, then you have come down on the right side of the culture. But if you talk about anything that looks like it might threaten marriage and family, that's taboo. And um, I actually believe that sex work is going to be um, probably more accepted. I think it already is more acceptable to the culture 
at this point because we've got a harm reduction lens that we're looking through. Um, and we're a ways off in saying that people are allowed to have relationships, loving relationships with more than one person at a time. Mm. So, yeah, I think it's marriage and family. Yeah. Our views about monogamy. That right. Really and of course, saying that, that prostitution that. or sex work um, threatens the family is, is and, and, and marriage is a little bit backwards. Isn't it? It's like saying the fire department causes fires. It's like, like the. Yeah. I mean, you know, like, well, when I, when I, yeah, I, I, I see your point. I mean, when I, when I look at society, to me, I'm not, to me there's I'm not without. There's some there's yeah. something there's something imbalanced about the fact that it's men paying for for sex from women. It's all it's the you know that why why is it so imbalanced in terms of supply and demand? Yes, <laughs> I know, I know. Believe me, but as a as a rebel, I have tried to access sexual acts uh, services myself, and and a couple times I I, I have paid for sex. With women, um, I've never paid a man. Although one of my boyfriends um, was a male escort, um, but I didn't have to pay him. So there is a supply and demand thing there, um, and I don't know if we could get away from that or not. I don't know how much of that is biological and how much of that is just cultural. I, I, that's an interesting question that I live with. And I like studying other cultures that aren't even human. I like looking at the bonobos where everybody has sex uh, free and available to them. And yet still somehow prostitution shows up even with the bonobos um, as exchanging sex for sugar cane. So it's, I don't know, we, we've been able to document uh, forms of prostitution in some birds and in some insects is just this exchange for resources mm -hmm. for sex that does happen. And so far, uh, those documentations have been female animals procuring resources through sex. But mm -hmm. it's an interesting question. I want to go back to something that's a little easier to answer. And that is, I really have a lot of respect for the the importance of fidelity and honesty, whatever. So polyamory means many loves. It doesn't mean lots of sex. It can be for some people, but it gets misappropriated a lot of times and turns out to be, a, you know, about um, hmm. a lot of promiscuity. And I just, I think there's something really beautiful about choosing to have sex with just one person. And that is certainly where my life is at at this point. I have one sexual partner and I want it that way. And um, I have no interest in touching other people or engaging in uh, sexual contact with other people. But how much of that is because I've had so much already? I, I, I don't have any curiosity about that. I already know so much more than most people. So I don't begrudge people who are curious and people who want to explore. And I, I wish we could kind of look at life as our sexuality as being a journey so that people are allowed to explore and get to know themselves. And to do that ethically, to do that honestly, we have to move away from shame and we have to move away from compulsory um, types of sexuality. You know, when we demand that people are straight, when we demand that people are monogamous, we're always going to drive anything that falls outside of that underground. And then we're going to see problems um, because it isn't out in the open and mm. it's got this layer of shame around it. Yeah. I don't in any way, shape or form want to take anything away from any person who feels pain for having been cheated on. I've had experiences with my husband cheated on me um, before we got married, while we were engaged. And I was working as an escort at the time, but that wasn't our agreement. 
our agreement was I was working as an escort and he was not cheating. Mm -hmm. Um, when we got married, our agreement changed to he could see prostitutes, but he couldn't have sex with anybody else. He did that a little bit and then he got really bored and we were sometimes swinging and trying to experiment as a, cu a couple and we got bored with that too. And we just kind of turned into uh, a uh, boring monogamous couple that stayed home and watched uh, movies when I wasn't out you know, flying to New York to see a client. The life of a sex worker is actually, it, it can have glamour to it. I, you know, certainly had my share of limousines and five-star restaurants and fancy hotels and, and, you know, lots of television shows. But I also was just a married wife with mm. stepchildren and a dog and a cat. It was a normal life in a lot of ways. And one of the reasons that I went on all those TV shows was to try to tell people, this, normal people are doing this. You just don't know about it because, you know, it's shameful and unfortunately a crime. Hmm. Yeah. So we're over an hour now. We and yeah. So I, I have to make a, a request. I have to yeah. make a request of you. Can we get back together for part two to talk about IFS? Well, yeah, you know what? I'll tell you what I'd like to do in part two. Uh, and I'm, and I'm, thank you, because I, I actually have a coaching client coming up here at the top of the hour. So I don't want to be late for that. But I, um, I'd really love to talk about going from being a high-end escort to becoming a relationship coach. It it was a difficult transition, not because I didn't have skill sets and something to offer, but because of people's attitudes mm. that really demonized that. Um, and how I gradually won people over so that they trusted me. Um, some of them, I think, just forgave me for being an escort in my past life. And I think others really valued it as um, a rich uh, resource mm. that they wanted to tap into. Um, and I, I, today I work with mostly married couples and, um, most of them are heterosexual. Although, you know, I, I have trans clients and I've got gay and lesbian clients and polyamorous clients, but the vast majority of people are, you know, heterosexual monogamous people. And, and they seem to find a lot of value in my work. So it would be a lot of fun to just track that transition. Absolutely. If, if yeah. So we can we can just you. sort of pick up there and then the IFS, I think, will flow naturally from what you offer as a yeah. relationship coach. Yeah. Uh, so okay. that was my little teaser. <laughs> you, you clearly you clearly have a background in television. <laughs> Details yeah. at 11. <laughs> Exactly. Tune in for the next episode. Awesome. Well, this, this has been just amazing <laughs> and eye opening. And, um, you know, listening to mm. you talk and kind of, you know, doing parallel processing with a lot of the, my unquestioned assumptions has been really interesting. Oh, right. So. Yeah, well, feel free to um, like send me some thoughts and we can, by the way, I don't know if um, if your viewers uh, ask questions, but if you if if we want to field some questions the next time we get together, I'd love to do that too because I I realize that for me um, this is you know it's my life, so it makes sense and it's but usually it arouses yeah. a lot of questions. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll open it up if 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 people um, you you know can ask whatever question and there may be some that you're like that's a boring question i don't feel like answering that or that's none of your business um <laughs> you know you're not that's none of your business it's interesting those words have never come out of my mouth i don't know what's wrong with me howie but okay. i just seem to be an open book <laughs> so here i am because well, i, I <laughs> but but i have sometimes said i don't want to answer that or I'll answer this part of the question, especially if I'm trying yeah. to protect somebody I remember, else's I remember privacy. listening to an interview, uh, I think Tim Ferriss did with Alice Little. 
um, who's a sex worker out of Nevada. Yeah. And, you know, she was just like, she gave like a master class on vibrators. I was like, that's really interesting. Let me, <laughs> let, uh. me let me, what was, what was the <laughs> model of that one? <laughs> so. Uh, right. <laughs> right. So I think, you know, there's sort of there. Yeah. Well, and you have to, some questions might come up for you too. So just awesome. feel free to we'll send do. them my and way. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for part one, for, for sharing all this. Uh, I'm, I'm really curious to hear yeah. the, the feedback from, from my audience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and um, thank you. You know, I don't usually, I, I'm a guest speaker on a lot of webinars nowadays, and we never talk about escorting. We always talk about um, the things uh -huh. that I'm helping people with. And uh, largely because I got really tired of, the same old boring questions. So thank you for bringing me fresh questions, but most, most importantly, intelligent oh, ones. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, I, there's a whole, there's a whole, you know, blind spot in my <laughs> life where there's, there's room for, for great learning and, and increased discernment and compassion. And you've opened my eyes to it. Oh, good. Yeah. If we can, if we can be a little more loving towards everybody, including men, I would. Yeah, world and, and that's another place. teaser for uh, IFS, right? It's hard. It's hard to. It's hard yeah. to do IFS wi yeah. without you know seeing what? seeing everybody's coherence for everything they're doing. It's true. So I'll I'll leave with this one statement. There is no excuse for perpetrations and everybody must be accountable for their perpetrations, myself included. And you know something? There is a lovable side to perpetrators and there is an avenue forward where we don't have to cancel people um, and we don't have to demonize mm. groups. We've really got to stop having this polarized world that we live in. Right on. So... Uh, yeah. Men are lovely. I love men. <laughs> all right. Well, on, on behalf of all of us, thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll talk again soon. Thanks, Howie. Thank you, Veronica.